And the Lord's servant must not strive, but be gentle towards all, apt to teach, forbearing, in meekness, correcting them that oppose themselves. Everyone say, oppose themselves. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. If peradventure God may give them repentance unto the knowledge of the truth, that they may recover themselves, you cannot recover yourself until you quit opposing yourself. And so the objective is for people to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. I don't know if you get these word pictures, but you got a demonic snare. It almost looks like Satan's snare is people imprisoning themselves. And so it isn't so much that sometimes people need God to deliver them. God needs to show them that they need to deliver themselves. You get that? Okay. Having been taken captive by him uh, at his will. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Let your blessings be upon the word and the people gathered here tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. I got to thinking about this self-opposition. And I know that probably a lot of us have experienced something akin to it. Sometimes in the spirit world, it's a little harder to recognize than it is in the physical world. Any of you that do a particular kind of a job that requires using leverage and um, would, would understand this. Um, particularly if you're handling heavy machinery or heavy things. I know we have some people that move furniture and things like that. It's, it's really about the leverage. I worked in a sawmill. Anyone work in a sawmill ever? Sawmill work is hard work. Sometimes that wood is so wet that when the saw goes through it, it literally sprays water in every direction. And so I, my first job was to work on what they called the green chain. Well, the green chain is basically a conveyor belt that comes off of the massive saws that will saw large timbers, uh, tuba 12s, uh, you know, four by six, whatever, coming at you like a wall on a conveyor chain. The objective is you have to pull the board off uh, the conveyor and you have to stack it neatly on railroad, kind of railroad trolleys and off they go to the next station that they have to go to. Needless to say, the fatigue can become incredible. And it's extremely incredible until you learn how to use the weight of the board, right? To actually allow itself to slide in place. Because if you try to handle it yourself, you're gonna fight yourself until you're completely exhausted. We used to get a kick out of newcomers to the green chain, no matter how big they were, no matter how strong they might have thought they were. Within a half an hour, their legs were like spaghetti and their hands couldn't even, uh, you know, pick up their lunchbox. They were so fatigued because something that you have to learn, and that is to learn to work with the leverage. If you don't, you will fight yourself. That's the point. Well, what is true in, in terms of moving heavy equipment or handling heavy material or even doing what might seem to be simple tasks that require understanding uh, how not to wear yourself out um, is so true in the realm of the Spirit. I want you to notice that in this passage of Scripture, there are people, and when I say people, I mean us. Many times it's been you and I that place themselves in the unbelievable position of not even needing the devil to bother them because they have themselves in the prison of self-opposition. Hopefully we can help ourselves extricate ourselves from the prison of self opposition we've said it to each other we've heard it preached making up your mind is 90 percent of the victory right living by the principles of the word of god 
If you wait till you feel like worshiping, you know how often you're going to worship? Well, you know. Why do you worship? You worship on principle. You worship not because of how you feel, but because of who He is. Same way with prayer. And many times people try to live for God without prayer. They run into roadblocks. They fight depression and discouragements. And they don't know why it's so difficult for them. So here we have to do, first of all, in order for someone to become free from self-opposition, they need a revelation that the trouble sometimes lies within our own self. And it's important to understand this, that it is not necessarily a deliberate act that places us in self-opposition. Sometimes it's just not knowing how or not knowing what in order to get the job. I've always marveled that people can throw a baseball a long way or snap a football. I never was able to do it. It's not like I throw it like a girl or anything, but, but you know what I'm saying. I just can't burn a hole in the other guy's glove or pitch it from way out field like I see some do. Well, it, 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 it isn't a matter of strength. Somehow it's a matter of technique. So a person that can snap a ball and throw it a long ways basically is not fighting the physics of throwing the ball. Whereas someone who cannot do that, they're in their own way essentially. And um, we're not so much in, interested in developing ourselves athletically here tonight, although some of us could use all the athletics we could get, and my, my, myself included. But we're talking about spiritual victories, praise God. Would anybody like some tips on how to enter into the Spirit, stay in the Spirit, live victoriously in the Spirit, and not allow the devil, amen, just to watch us surround ourselves with our own difficulties? And so we do it in a variety of ways. Number one way to oppose yourself is to hold on to a theory that contradicts Scripture. We must always test our beliefs against Scripture. Because people who believe certain things that are in opposition to the Scripture can find themselves in a position of self-contradiction. And in logic, one of the things that you always look for that makes the argument invalid is if you can get a contradiction. If you can get a contradiction in the problem, then you know that the, uh, that the, the conclusion is not valid and it's not true. And so when we get a contradiction against the Word of God, we can have some real problems. First, Tim First Timothy 6.20 says this, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely notice that oppositions of science falsely so called now i am not a scientist but i love science i like to read scientific based magazines and articles i find myself attracted to the science of medicine and cures and um, to the science of um, mechanics and physics. They're all interesting topics. And uh, we wouldn't be where we are as a civilization without the breakthroughs connected with science. But there is a difference between science and scientism. And for those of you that are in college or high school, You've already run into the proponents of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and, and the likes of, uh, of uh, those that are trying to teach an entire generation that only stupid people believe in God and that the smart scientific types uh, are atheists or agnostics. Well, I want to tell you, people who ascribe to scientism are deeply... Uh, how shall I say this? Entangled in their own sense of self-opposition. Let me give you a couple of, of examples. According to the uh, agnostic or the atheist or to the scientist or to the believer in scientism, let's just say that, that everything in the universe that exists must be of material, must be material in nature. In other words, Nothing exists that is not measurable, 
testable and um, in some way tangible, right? And so by doing this, they reduce uh, the nature of reality to exclude anything spiritual and anything that has to do with God. Evolutionary geologist Robert Hazen said this in a, in a lecture at George Mason University. He said, I make the basic assumption that life emerged by some kind of natural process. And I propose that uh, life arose by a sequence of events that are completely consistent with natural laws of chemistry and physics. And so he went on to talk about that. Problem with the naturalist hanging on to this idea that life only came from chemical combinations is that they are juxtaposed against a law of biogenesis. Any of you that have taken science in one of the first chapters in your science book, you will always read this sentence. Life comes from other life. It is a scientific fact and it is a scientific law that living things come from other living things that parent them in some way, shape, or form. So when the naturalist says, my, my theory of naturalism says somehow inert, unliving, chemical combinations created the first living thing, what they are doing is opposing a very firmly grounded law called biogenesis. Life only comes from life. And so they're in a contradiction. And they have to be brought to the realization that they're going to remain in that contradiction until, first of all, somebody could prove that chemicals can produce living things. Fifty years of an attempt to do it has, in, has turned up zilch. And another 50 years from now, and another 500 years from now, is going to be the same thing. Okay, so then the naturalist has the explanation for the origin of matter, right? What do they say? Somehow, 14.7 billion years ago, there was a big boom. And from this big bang came all of this cosmology of the universe. Everything in the universe popped into existence from an explosion. Now, we could say a lot about this alleged explosion. Um, it's the only explosion on record where it exploded everything together instead of apart. That's interesting. When I was a boy, I used to blow things up with those M80s. Never blew anything together that I can remember. But this one blew everything together. But the problem is, when it is suggested by those that want to discourage people's belief in the Creator, that you don't need a creator because matter originated. A matter brought itself into being by virtue of some kind of an explosion. You know, that doesn't explain anything. Because you need energy, and you need physical laws, and you need um, the, 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 the energy fields that somehow exploded into all of this stuff. And then there's no explanation for how that got here. Then you have the first, so people that say this, people that tell you, oh yeah, it just, there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was this big bang and there was everything. Remember this, from nothing, nothing comes. Nothing can't come from nothing. There's a song about that. Nothing. Uh, uh. But the line of the song says you got to have something. Hmm. And so what was that something? That something was the creator. Otherwise, you're flying in contradiction to the first and second laws of thermodynamics. What is the first law of thermodynamics? Well, it is this. Matter cannot be created, neither can it be destroyed. This is what the laboratories have discovered. Matter can change forms. You can light a match and you can burn it to ashes, but you have not 
gotten rid of its properties. All it has done is changed forms. Matter cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. So if we can't create matter, we can't even create so much as a grain of sand. How in the world can nothing do what the genius of human nature can't do? It can't do it. Well, someone says, I need proof that there's a God. The proof is all around us. It's called creation. There is the book of scripture, then there's the book of nature. And the book of nature speaks with loud characters. Look at me, the heavens declare the glory of God. You look around, because there is something and not nothing, there is someone at the back of it all who got it all in motion. Otherwise, you know, the scientific groups that are opposing God are actually in contradiction. This is my point. They're living in a contradiction to the first and second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is what they call the law of entropy. That just simply means things grow... Uh, enter the, the creation runs down in time like a clock that's wound up until it little by little gets slower 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 till it runs down and stops well that principle is in operation everywhere and so as the sun shines it burns a little more of its energy one day the sun won't shine anymore because it won't have any energy left so that is the second law and that is everything tends towards disorder wouldn't it be awesome if there was a law of organization that you snapped your fingers and a teenage kid's bedroom was all of a sudden organized everything is folded it's properly hung up the hangers are spaced exactly equal to each other and it's just perfect like a magazine well i'm sorry to inform you but the law of entropy says the tendency is for things to get messy I know what I'll do. I'll leave the house a mess, go on a week's vacation, and when I come back, some kind of miracle is going to self-organize everything. No, it won't. It's going to be messy and dusty. <laughs> and if you leave a place alone long enough, it crumbles to the ground. That's why we have all these maintenance projects around the place, because uh, things are falling apart, and we're trying to prop them back up constantly. All right, I spent enough time there. I could talk about macroevolution. I could talk about uh, the eternality of matter, but I won't do that. I, I won't pick on the scientisms anymore tonight. But let's just talk about, uh, how about this? What about when religious people think they're believing something biblical, but it's not? They are in self-opposition. Not long ago, we had a strong proponent of once saved, always saved. Do people know what that eternal security doctrine is? Have you heard of it? Some of you think about it? Basically, in a nutshell, it says this, that once you are a child of God, nothing, you cannot get unsaved once you're saved. You're just eternally, forever saved. Well, that would be great if it was biblical. And someone not long ago uh, was very passionate and they were a very likable person but unfortunately they were believing something that was putting them in opposition to spiritual principle and spiritual law Hebrews chapter number 6 verses 4 through 8 says this and I want you to listen if you can find it I don't know if I gave you that one it says for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance seeing they crucify themselves to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame now does that sound like eternal security to you it sounds to me like the um, the freedom with which somebody has to approach God and find salvation is the same freedom they have to abandon God and jeopardize their salvation. 
This isn't a God thing. This is a person doing thing. We, we can undo what God has done in our lives. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20 and through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Does that sound like eternal security? No, it sounds like that our souls are perpetually in, in under the possible threat of being jeopardized, not because God will pull out, but because we will pull out. Now, let me go to a positive verse now that I've kind of bummed you out and made you think, oh God, is that me? Well, if, it, if you think it's you, you need to pray through. James 5, 19 through 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Well, it's gratifying to know that even when we do place our relationship with God in jeopardy, the possibility exists to recover what has been lost. That's why each and every one of us need to see ourselves as potential reconcilers. When you come across somebody who's on the verge of giving up on God, don't give up on them. Pray for them, love them, reach out to them, encourage them, surround them with faith, and then perhaps if you're able to help them recover themselves, then a multitude of sin has been, um, has been covered. Faith without works, right? There's people that say, yeah, I believe the Lord. And there is absolutely no effort made whatsoever towards sanctification. Now, if you've ever wondered if people are happier who believe in Jesus, but have not changed their life through repentance one iota, can I settle that for you? It's impossible for them to be happier than someone who is trying, even though we try and fail and try and fail and try and fail. Why? Because they're in opposition to the Word of God. The Word of God does not teach the new convert just to believe and then remain unchanged and unmotivated and unchallenged. But what does the Word of God teach us to do? It teaches us to cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You say, but I try and I fail. Yep, so try again and again and again and again because it is not the destination that brings the joy. It is the journey. It is being able to look back and compare to your crude self when you first came to God with your massive imperfections, you've come a mighty long way. No, you're not all the way there yet, but you're making progress and the joy is in the journey. We've come across people who say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in tongues. Bad choice. How can we accept the Lord Jesus and reject speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance and not be in opposition to our own self? If it feels a little bit good to accept the Lord Jesus, then it's going to be a truckload of good when you lift your hands, repent of your sins, and allow the Spirit of Jesus to absolutely, completely flood your soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why we need to teach people about the blessing of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay. I want to... Uh, I want to close with one more point and that is we oppose ourselves this is for those of us that maybe don't have some of these other situations going on you're giving it what you got you're doing the best you know how you're living the the scripture as best as you know how but 
you still feel like that there's a struggle. You still feel like that there is a bind. It's very possible that you are simply opposing yourselves because you're living beneath your own potential. The reason why we need challenges in our lives is because otherwise we would never be able to discover what we're capable of doing. Once in a while you read about someone who has the car fall on uh, the chest of a person working and then a neighbor or a woman or somebody comes up and lifts the car, uh, takes enough weight off the person mir seemingly miraculously so that they can free themselves from other wa what otherwise might would have been a deadly situation. I don't deny that some of those things have happened. And I don't deny under given the right conditions there may be heroes and heroines in this place tonight. Most people who are attributed the title of being a hero just say, I'm just an ordinary person. I, I just happened to be there and I wasn't about to just let... I saw a YouTube little video clip. Some of you might have saw it. A woman ready to throw herself on the subway tracks. Did you see that? And a man sitting, I don't know, this far away from her. She, as the train was approaching, she got up and ran to throw herself on the tracks. He got up in an instant of time, grabbed her collar by the nap of the neck and wrestled her back and saved her life I mean God give me that kind of reaction time if I need it I usually kind of move kind of slow when it comes to that kind of stuff this fellow was right on it how did he do that <clears throat> he probably didn't know because the situation call, <clears throat> called for that kind of greatness <clears throat> excuse me so I don't want to live beneath our privilege. I think our church is well beneath our privilege. I think we can be the, a massive, powerful, devil-chasing, apostolic, gift-filled congregation. I think that we can attract people by the hundreds. Amen. I think there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people in our community that are just looking for a place like this one right here. Praise God. And if we expect... Uh, nothing then we're going to receive nothing but my job is to challenge you and to challenge me to say wait a second we're not going to settle for mediocre we are going to reach for the very best and most that God could give us as a church does anybody believe that's possible I read an article. Let me read you the title. I'm going to close with this. How to reverse aging and become whoever you want to be. Instantly that got my attention. 1978, researcher Ellen Langer, Harvard psychologist, conducted a study. She conducted the study among nursing home patients. And among the nursing home patients, they were divided into two groups. One group was given the task of watering and caring for um, house plants in their rooms and wherever. The other group um, was told that the plants would be cared for by the staff and that they didn't need to worry about it and they didn't need to order their daily schedule in any way to take care of the plants. After 18 months, the group that were given the daily schedule of tending to the plants, two-thirds of them were still alive, whereas the other group in other words, it was a two-thirds ratio of longevity compared to the group that did nothing slept as long as they wanted, didn't care about anything but their own self, wallow in their own misery or memory, what have you. And so suddenly she felt like she was on to something. Giving people responsibility is good for them. Giving people something that they need to do is good for them. And it extended their life by 18 months as opposed to the others. And so she conducted another study in 1981. Her and a group of graduate students 
uh, got a building and they decorated the building in 1950s retro style. A lot of that's popular today. They got a group of eight 70-year-olds that were in retirement homes. And they brought these 70-year-olds to the 1950s memorabilia of this world that they remembered uh, when they were much younger. And they told them, we want you to remember what it was like when you were in the 50s, to talk of the things that happened in the 50s, to remember the things of the 50s, and uh, not to fill your mind with current events and news events. Just live in that moment when you were at least 20 or more years younger than you are today. Now listen to me. After five days, these, many of these people were so ill that their children had brought them, had to carry their, their luggage in. Most of them maybe had, had had equipment to assist them to walk, canes or walkers and things. After five days days. They walked out under their own power. They packed their own bags. They came down the steps unassisted and they carried their own suitcase. And so from that moment the, uh, the, this, this study concluded that, that when you put people in a particular context and by expecting them to function independently and expecting them to fit into a 20-year earlier context. Their mind had an effect on their physiology in a way that was measurable. Remember what we're talking about here, how to um, reverse aging and feel better about yourself. So here's the point. Your personality is not a fixed entity. Your personality and character are fluid and they're ever-changing based on how you frame your life experience. If you see yourself as going down and getting weaker, if you see yourself as lonely and forgotten, if you see yourself as sickly and unhealthy, then that is exactly what we, all of us, will experience. As a church, if we see ourselves as holding on, hoping, oh God, that we don't lose another soul, that'll be our fate, that'll be our battle. But if we see ourselves as a mighty, militant, powerful, Holy Ghost, God-blessed, doctrinally correct, spiritual, passionate, amen, committed, consecrated people, we will have apostolic revival and God will bless us and visit us, amen, with a move of the Holy Ghost. And we will have the kind of services that we talked about, amen, to the brush arbors or wherever, amen, those days are not gone when the people that do know their God will pursue God, God will be there for us. So I said that to say this. this. This study came up with this statement. Your most authentic self is not who you currently are, but rather who you desire to become. Could it be that we feel the way we feel? We struggle with the depressions that we struggle with. We feel isolated and alone and hopeless simply because we have accepted the notion that nothing will ever change for me. Well, I break that paradigm and say in the name of Jesus, we serve a change agent. We serve a God who breaks the monotonies of life and shatters the chains that hold people prisoners to their past and says, wait a minute here, you can be different. You can be anointed. You can be set free. You can have a ministry. You can make a difference in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I'm not going to wander through life anymore. I'm going to say to God, I'm going to say to myself, Lord, I'm going to decide. Uh, you are the author and finisher of my faith. But you know what we've done? We've authored it and we finished it. And our finishing isn't they don't live happily ever after. We finished all kinds of gloom and doom and despair. I probably won't have more, any more friends next week than I have now. If you get out there and make a friend, you'll have another friend. God probably won't heal me. If you don't ask him to, he probably won't. But if you lift your hands and say, my Bible says, by your stripes we were healed. 
Come on, don't oppose yourself by shortchanging your potential. Oh, if we're not careful, we're just one step behind a lot of the Christian movements that say the time of the apostles was back then. No miracles, no tongues, no breakthroughs, no raising of the dead, no casting out of devils. We don't say it that way, but we're sometimes thinking it. God, in the name of Jesus, we are the direct descendants of that batch of people that broke out of that upper room and turned the world upside down down. I refuse to accept anything less than the biblical description for the New Testament church. If you agree with me, let's stand and lift our hands and let's receive it in Jesus' name. I'm a one God. I'm a tongue talking. I'm a devil chasing. I'm a, I'm a healing preaching saint of God. I believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. I stand on the promises of God's word. The past does not prologue. If we have never seen a miracle that doesn't mean we can't see one in the name of Jesus you're a miracle worker because the Word of God promises it I'm not going to live in opposition to myself I'm not going to live in opposition to the book of Acts I'm not going to live in opposition to the words of Jesus I'm not going to live in opposition to my spiritual heritage uh, Peter James Paul John the Apostles of old uh, the members of the Azusa Street Revival we're part and parcel of that great heritage amen and that spirit is still alive and well today would you give the Lord a hand clap <laughs> hallelujah 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 thank you Jesus 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 my God hallelujah come on somebody break out of it come on somebody receive your blessing in the name of Jesus Come on, somebody talk in tongues, even if it's been a long time. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lamb of God, 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 we bless your name. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. Amen. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's a spiritual church. It's an anointed church. It's a church that pursues holiness in the fear of God. It's a church that baptizes in the only name given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. It's a one God church. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a Jesus name church. I'm glad to be a part of that. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Reach over to someone and pray for them. Pray that they won't get in their own way. Lord, help my brother or my sister not to be their own worst enemy. In the name of Jesus, help my brother or my sister to get out of their own way. In the name of Jesus, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Try to live for God without prayer. You're in your own way. Try to be victorious and avoid the Word of God. You're in your own way. Try to come to church once in a while. You're in your own way. Oh, mighty God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, I'm getting out of my own way, God. I'm going to quit opposing myself. I'm going to free myself from the snare of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, Satan, you're going to have to work to get me now because I'm not going to imprison myself no more. In the name of Jesus, I'm free. I'm writing the script. I'm, I'm going on the adventure. I'm not just accepting things as they've always been. I'm believing for a new vision. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I feel the Holy Ghost power. Mighty God, mighty God, in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Change your vision and you'll change your experience. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you so much. We got a good group tonight on a Wednesday night that came early. I kept my, I kept, well, I sort of did. You need to go. 
Remember, tomorrow night, if you want to come to pray, the, you know, this is your church. You can come here as much as you want to and pray. But the, we're going to have a church-wide prayer meeting at 9.30 on Sunday morning. Praise God. God bless you. Shake hands. Be friendly. Next Wednesday, we should have the children's ministry working again.